afternoon, everyone. It is Tuesday, March 28th, 2023. It is 307 ish. And I call this meeting of the Senate Elections Committee to order. And there is a quorum present. Senator Carlson, would you like to have a seat? Today we are going to begin discussion of the elections uh, budget omnibus bill, um, Senate file 1636, uh, which is chief authored by Senator Carlson. And I understand, Senator Carlson, that um, we have a delete all A11 uh, author's amendment. And I understand that there is a technical amendment, the A13, that we are going to incorporate into the A11 Delete Everything Authors Amendment. Is that your understanding? That is my understanding, Madam Chair. All right. So we will incorporate the A13 technical amendment into the A11 uh, Delete Everything Authors Amendment. So uh, Senator Carlson moves the A11 Authors Amendment as amended to get the bill into the form in which you'd like to have it. Is that what you'd like to do, uh, Senator Carlson? Yes, Madam Chair. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No. The motion is adopted. The A11 author's amendment is adopted as amended. All right, Senator Carlson, please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I'm proud to be the author of the election's budget omnibus bill, which is a complimentation of much work, much of the work that we've done as a committee this session. It includes provisions that protect and expand the freedom to vote in Minnesota, to make candidates more accountable to voters themselves, and to increase the transparency of lobbying at all levels of government. I'd like to have Ms. Stangel and Mr. Erickson walk through the bill now. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Mr. Erickson, let's start with you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, there are a couple of spreadsheets in your packet today, and I'd just like to orient you to uh, one of them, and then we'll walk through the other one. Uh, the one that's printed in color is a much more detailed uh, uh, version of the spreadsheet. Uh, you'll see along the left side the various agencies that are in the bill, along with itemized change items. Uh, this is the more detailed one that actually builds up to specific appropriation totals that are in the bill. Um, it, by way of orientation along the top, you'll see that there are several columns for the current biennium, 22-23. There are expanded columns for the budget biennium, 24-25, and tails columns shaded in green for 26-27. Uh, the change items are up here below the pink stripes and then uh, are listed out there. I I think that's about as much orientation as we need to do for this. It's in a lot of ways uh, more useful for putting the bill together. And I think the summary change item page, um, which is the, the grayscale printout, is more useful for us to look at for purposes uh, of, of walking through what's in uh, Senate file 1636. So if you'll follow me through that spreadsheet, you'll see a much, much more uh, simple version that has just columns for uh, the Senate for fiscal 24 and 25, and then shaded columns for the tails in 26, 27. Because these are all changes from base, it doesn't have quite the level of detail, but it, it isolates the actual changes that are in the bill. So I'll begin walking through. Uh, with the legislature, there is a, uh, some money in the legislate for the legislature, 467,000 in the current by in the budget biennium and 418,000 in the tails for a task force related to ranked choice voting. This funds um, some uh, costs for the LCC to hire folks to staff that and for reimbursement for the public members. For the Secretary of State's office, the first three items there on lines 10, 11, and 12 are governor's change items. Uh, the election administration and voter information is new FTEs for the Secretary of State to hire folks dedicated to certain election staffing. Uh, the Hava State match is a little higher than what the governor had included because it covers both tranches of Hava funds that were made available. Um, this amount is the amount transferred from the general fund into the Hava account. On line 12 are the redistricting litigation fees, including interest that has accrued since the governor first submitted this proposal. Uh, this is related to the, the attorney's fees awarded um, that, that the Secretary of State is required to uh, pay. The line 13 is various elections administration changes from Senator Westland, Senate file 1191. These are mostly programming costs uh, and are one time. There is 
also some programming costs along with some maintenance requirements uh, for the early voting provisions in the bill which come from Senate file 1434 Senator Bolden's bill oh I apologize Senator uh, the ranked choice voting task force and implementation and ranked choice voting grants are two more components of Senate file 2270 Senator Morrison's bill uh, the task force and implementation relate to staffing that the Secretary of State has and then requirements that they have to um, um, related to implementation that Ms. Stangle will cover in a moment the ranked choice voting grants are reserved for grants to locals uh, who choose to implement uh, ranked choice voting there's also $800,000 in the bill one time for accessibility uh, grants. Uh, this was from Senate file 2144, Senator Hoffman's bill. Moving to the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board, the first two items there were governor's change items. Uh, the first line is to maintain current service levels. This is a $338,000 appropriation in the budget biennium and $378,000 in the tails. And then a 50,000 annual appropriation for uh, mig migrating network and databases to the minute Azure cloud solution that uh, uh, would not be an absorbable cost for the board. There is also a change for two new audit staff at the campaign finance board on line 23 for $440,000 in each biennium. Uh, the public subsidy change, it comes from Senate file 2845, Senator Murphy's bill and comes in two components. One is a 3.38 million one-time transfer into the account and then a uh, delayed effective date tr um, statutory change to the amount transferred uh, currently in statute. That is a $3.13 million increase ongoing beginning in fiscal year uh, 2027. Uh, and then finally, there is some changes related to lobbyist registration for uh, including all lobbyists from political subdivisions. This is from Senator Bolden's bill uh, and includes some, some staff and rulemaking costs for the board. Uh, finally, there is a one-time change to a report required of the Department of Corrections, and that is a $165,000 change. If you move down a little bit, the committee is also required to account in its target for any spending in bills that are being carried separately. One of these is Senate File 3, Senator Bolden's bill, and that has both a revenue component on line 38 related to some um, uh, re reports that can be requested and for which uh, receipts are deposited in the general fund, and then a um, general fund expenditure portion on line 49 uh, that's being carried at a cost of 1.06 million dollars in the budget biennium and 822,000 in the tails there is also uh, Senator Champion's House File 28 which was enacted earlier this session uh, for $14,000 one time so then you'll find the net general fund spending down on line 55 this is the amount that is being spent over or uh, this is the total amount and should be compared to the amount on line 43 which was the general fund base uh, the target for the committee was 10 million dollars this which permitted the committee to spend up to 24 million 602,000 compare that to the number on line 57 and you'll see that the uh, the chair has met the target by $13,000 and Ma Madam Chair, that is all that I have on that spreadsheet. If everybody could just take the bill briefly, the one other um, statutory change that committee members should be aware of is on page three of the bill, where there is an, uh, a section related to the HAVA account. So money is being appropriate or is being transferred into that account, as I mentioned earlier, as a uh, state match from the general fund. But there's also a change here to statutorily appropriate that money out of the account on a permanent basis. And Madam Chair, that is it for the uh, walkthrough. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. And now, Ms. Stangle, if you could walk us through the actual bill, that would be great. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Looking at the A11 Delete Everything Amendment, uh, as we walk through, I will point out where the changes to the A11 were made by the A13. So starting on page four with Article Two, uh, Section One, is one of the election judge intimidation provisions, uh, and this has the attorney general assisting in the enforcement of those provisions that come later in the bill. Section two is a change to the definition of lobbyist to refer to all political subdivisions and not just the metropolitan government unit. And so this will have the effect of lobbyists having to report anything doing with any political subdivision instead of metropolitan government units, and that change is made throughout this section as well as other sections coming up in the bill. 
on page six after line five, there will be a new section from the A13 and that defines official action of political subdivisions. Section three on page six is the lobbyist report and requires the lobbyist to uh, report specific subjects of interest that they are lobbying on as well as some additional items um, that they are lobbying on and where they are lobbying on. And you'll also see that there are changes here to refer to political subdivisions. On page seven, section four, this is the principal report and it amends what is required in those reports. Now, it re instead of rounding amounts, it requires total amounts spent um, and it breaks out the different categories and disbursements that must be included. On page eight, section five, and on page nine, section six, there are two changes from metropolitan government unit to political subdivision. Uh, section seven is a similar change. It just strikes metropolitan government unit to refer to all local officials. And section nine requires the statewide voter registration system to be able to prepare reports for early voting. And the A13 made a change to that effective date um, related to the certification of the SVRS being ready for um, early voting. On page 11, section nine, uh, you'll remember from the policy bill, there were several sections that changed the term resided to maintains residence. That is another change here on a form and there was a small cost to that, which is why it was in this bill. On page 12, uh, there is an effective date for section nine that will be added and that's June 1st, 2023. The A13 uh, deleted section 10, section 11, uh, requires presidential primary political uh, party list to only go to the chairs of the party, so they only get the list of their voters. Section 12 on page 12 and section 13 on page 13 are um, sections that were in the policy bill requiring the Commissioner of Corrections to amend their reporting to conform with the restoration of civil rights, and they've been moved into this bill because there was a cost identified after the policy bill um, passed, so they'll be carried in this bill going forward. Section 14 on page 14 specifies that all the election laws in Minnesota apply to early voting unless otherwise specified. Um, and there are a number of changes in the A13 amendment that you'll see changing the number 62 to 63, and you can see the first one of those on line 1428. It just uh, is correcting a section reference, and you'll see those throughout. Section 15 on the top of page 15 defines early voting. Section 16 um, specifies that the violations um, and prohibitions relating to absentee voting now also apply to early voting in some situations. On page 16, page, page 16 section 17 adds cross-references to early voting um, for full-time city clerks or town clerks to administer early voting in the way they administer absentee voting. Section 18 is only a headnote change to specify that the subdivision replies to, applies to absentee voting. Section 19 on page 17 requires early voting to be available for 18 days before federal, state, and county elections as well as municipal elections if the municipality authorizes the use of early voting. Section 20 allows for um, the alternative procedure where absentee voters are allowed to put their ballot into a ballot box for the 18 days uh, prior to an election um, and requires the voter to provide their date of birth if requested. You'll see that the same section appears in on page 18 in section 21 and that's because there's a later, later effective date here. There are some changes made to early voting. Uh, so the changes are duplicated in addition to the change on 12 and 18, 12 and 13 to refer to early voting. Section 22 on page 19 allows for uh, the designation of polling places that have different times and dates. So these are sometimes referred to as pop-up polling places so they can, they can um, have shorter days and hours. Section 23 um, moves language from somewhere else in existing law uh, to its own subdivision now saying voters can cast absentee ballots for 30 days before a town election in March. Section 24 requires the designating all polling places 14 weeks before the election. Section 25 requires notice to voters on the days, times, and locations for voting. And that must be on the Secretary of State's website as well. On page 20, section 26 requires the county to provide certain election equipment for every polling place. 
Section 27 specifies voting hours. So subdivision one uh, is the voting hours for state general election and subdivision two is for all other elections. And at the top of page 21, there's a provision that says all voters in line when a polling place is closed uh, must be allowed to vote in the same manner that they are as if they were in line on election day. On page 21, section 28, uh, requires names of voters who've submitted absentee ballots to be public, um, and it does no longer have to wait until after the election for that information to be public. Section 29 requires the Secretary of State to keep a list of early voters, and that list is public information. Section 30 uh, requires jurisdictions that use election, uh, early voting to have um, ballot boards. On page 22, section 31, um, has to do with the ballot board reviewing envelopes and it makes a change on the top of page 23 uh, about um, checking to see if the person has voted before the election um, and using that to determine whether or not their uh, envelope should be accepted or rejected. On page 24, section 32, after the, this allows um, and uh, absent, this is a change for opening envelopes related to opening absentee envelopes on the 19th day before the election. So after that 19th day, uh, individuals can't claw back their absentee ballot and the envelopes will be opened. Uh, it requires certain information about county elections now to go into the SVRS in a way that wasn't done before. And there's a current uh, provision in current law that, do that um, doesn't require the roster to be marked in the final week of the uh, leading up to the election and that has been stricken. Section 33 um, is the same record of voting provision again uh, with a later effective date and this includes a reference to early voting. Um, so that will be effective later. Section 34 on page 25 is the provision that allows absentee ballot envelopes to be opened after the close of business on the 19th day before the election. On the bottom of page 25, section 35 uh, is the process for early voting. On page 36, on section 36 on page 26, allows cities, towns, school districts, and other local districts to require write-in candidates to request to have their um, write-in votes counted. And the A13 amendment makes a change on page 26, 20, line 29. It reinstates the seventh day and deletes the 19th day. Um, so that has to do with when the request must be filed for a county, uh, essentially leaving paragraph A as current law. On page 27, section 37, this is a section about election um, judges being able to remove election officials for neglect of duty, malfeasance, misconduct, or other cause. Section 38 on page 28 requires the county auditor to make early voting information available to city clerks. At the bottom of page 28, section 39, removes the metro area geographical restriction on mail voting. So the result is any town or city with fewer than 400 registered voters may use mail voting. Section 40 um, allows mail ballot envelopes to be opened at the, after the close of business on the 19th day before the election and makes a maintains residency change. On the bottom of page 29, line 34, the A13 reinstated that language, so then it will refer to after the close of business on the 19th day. On page 30, section 41 is another mail election provision. Um, this allows for both a question and an office to be on the same ballot if there are overlapping jurisdictions and allows these envelopes to be opened uh, after close of business on the 19th day before the election. On page 31, line 11, again, that language after the close of business has been reinstated by the A13. On page 31, section 42, removes the specificity about putting a ballot into the ballot box uh, and just says, uh, sorry, re removes the specificity on the um, statutory references so it leaves it as you can get an I voted sticker if you've deposited your ballot into a ballot box. On page 32, there are a series of sections related to ranked choice voting. Section 43 um, is in uh, the provisions on election day general provisions and it provides a definition of ranked choice voting. Section 44 is the start of a new chapter 204E relating to ranked choice voting. Section 44 uh, provides that the chapter applies to ranked choice voting elections. Section 45 is a series of definitions related to ranked choice voting. And that 
takes us to page 35, section 46. This allows cities and school districts to adopt ranked choice voting after January 1st, 2025, if the city or school district has an odd year election. And that's um, a change from earlier uh, in the, when the bill was heard before the committee, that, that's a bit of a change. On page 36, section 47, uh, there are provisions about how the ballot is formatted for ranked choice voting, and if there is ranked choice voting and non-ranked choice voting. Section 48 has to do with um, tabulation centers and tabulating of the votes. There's a change on 3710 to refer to spoiled ballots. And that came in by way of the A13. On page 38, section 49 has to do with how you tabulate single seat elections and it goes through the process um, and the rounds that you go through to make those calculations. Section 50 is the same thing except for it is a multi-seat races. On page 42, section 52, there's a provision on recounts for ranked choice voting and how that process works. Section 53 is the post-election review for ranked choice elections. On page 41, uh, there, section 51 is this, uh, about reporting results from a ranked choice voting election, what must be reported and what materials must go where. Uh, there are several changes in this section, including on 41.17, delete the word totally, so it's just referring to defective and spoiled ballots. There are some cross-reference changes on 26 and 27. On page 43, paragraph B and C were deleted. And then the remainder of that section is unchanged by the A13. On page 44, section 54 allows the Secretary of State to adopt rules related to ranked choice voting. Section 55 uh, requires a notice of filing to include the type of election. Uh, section 56 requires places, uh, jurisdictions that use ranked choice voting to test the voting, voting systems to make sure it is compatible to use for ranked choice voting. Section 57 on page 45 prohibits creating or disclosing images of hard drives of election equipment except for where provided by law. On page 46, the A13 deleted section 58. Section 59 requires ranked choice candidate ranked choice voting candidates to file a report in the same manner as if they were in a primary. Section 60 is the provision related to election judge intimidation, uh, interference and tampering with voting equipment as well as obstructing access. Uh, provides for civil remedies and criminal penalties. On page 49, there's a provision on soliciting near your polling places and this is sometimes referred to as polling place apparel. Uh, and it talks about what you can wear or display in a polling place. And you'll see, uh, particularly of note, there's some change in here. Um, on 4922, there are some changes about the, how the prohibitions apply during the absentee and early voting period and during uh, on election day. As a result of the discussion and committee, those changes were added here. On page 50, section 62. Um, requires the election judge intimidation provisions to be enforced as provided in the earlier provision, not by using the administrative remedy provided in Chapter 211B. Section 63 requires the Secretary of State to certify uh, to the revisor of statute when the SVRS is ready and able to be used for, rank, uh, for, sorry, for early voting. And once that happens, the early voting provisions in the bill become effective. Um, and you'll see those sections throughout in the effective dates. Section 64 is ranked choice voting grants um, for local governments for um, equipment consulting and um, money for public ed education campaigns. The A13 amendment fills in the blanks on line 5124 at 50% and 51.25 at 75%. On page 52, section 65, there's the ranked choice voting task force. Um, and that task force is supposed to assess the, the adoption and implementation of statewide ranked choice voting um, and recommend any additional standards for local adoption. And on the last page, page 56, there's a repealer that repeals a provision in law that um, governs who can participate in a caucus. Thank you very much, Ms. Stangel. We are now going to move to testifiers. 
And um, our first testifier will be Nicole Freeman from the Office of the Secretary of State. Or there she is. Um, and then we have Karina Vieda, Vieda, who will be next. So if you want to come and sit, you can be ready to go. And we'll start with Ms. Freeman. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, for the record, my name is Nicole Freeman from the Office of the Secretary of State. <clears throat> Secretary Simon intended to be here but is unable um, to be here today due to a death in his family. So he submitted a letter to the committee earlier today, um, and I'll highlight a few points from that letter. We appreciate Chair Carlson for providing additional funding for the Office of the Secretary of State uh, Elections Divisions, as well as the Help America Vote Act um, required state match. These funds are critical to allow the office to continue to support election administrators across the state. Additionally, the HAVA dollars will continue to support the OSS cybersecurity and infrastructure needs, as well as allowing the office to assist local governments in improving election security through grant funding and our security navigator program. The funding provisions in this legislation also provide much needed resources to local governments in the form of grants to improve polling place accessibility. This legislation provides for a too early voting process that will streamline procedures for election administrators as well as provide increased access for voters by expanding the hours for in-person voting prior to election day. Another policy provision that we appreciate included in this legislation is a local option ring choice voting or RCV. This legislation has undergone significant and positive changes as it has moved through the committee process and now incorporates much of the feedback from the election administrators. As this bill moves forward, we would ask the committee to consider requiring the co-chair of the task force to not only be an election administrator, but that the person be a county administrator who is chosen by the Minnesota Association, county Office, Association of County Officers or MACO. The task force will need strong county leadership as it examines the changes necessary to our election system to administer ranked choice voting. Finally, I want to note one provision that is not in the bill, uh, but will support it, the bill's reforms. Senator Rust's Senate File 1548, which is traveling separately. Senate File 1548 provides necessary resources to Minnesota's local election officials, including county, city, and township administrators. The important reforms that this committee is advancing this session will improve access to voters, expand the freedom to vote, and modernize many of our systems. But these reforms do come with local implementation costs, and the costs for running Minnesota's elections continue to increase even without these changes. Thank you once again to the committee for your time and consideration of these bills, and thanks to Senator Carlson for this omnibus. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Freeman. And our next testifier, uh, Karina, is it Vieda? It's Vieda, yeah. Okay, go ahead and state your name for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Karina Vieda, or Vieda, that's in Spanish. I am a student at Ever Hills Community College and the Vice President of Libra Men, a student association representing the 100,000 community and technical college students in Minnesota. I am here to urge your support in Senate File 1636 because it will help build a stronger democracy that empowers more young people to be engaged. For a democracy to work, citizens must be engaged, from voting to being informed on the issues, from participating in juries to speaking out on issues that they believe in. But we are not born with these abilities. It is a skill that must be taught and learned by each generation. That is why the founders of this country believe that public education is critical to the success of American democracy. And this legislation works with higher education institutions to better support young people in becoming civically engaged. A common myth is that young people don't vote because they are apathetic or they don't care about politics. But that is false. Research from the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement found that barriers related to time, information, and other access issues that continue to prevent many young people from voting. This, sorry. And 
To finalize this, I want to thank the committee for listening to the concerns of students so we can create equal access and easy access to the ballot because it will help strengthen the American democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think there should be a sign-in sheet if you could um, sign in your name. And we will next have Alex Hassel and then we'll have uh, Matt Hilgart be um, on deck. And Ms. Hassel, if you could state your name for the record and um, the organization you are here with, and then please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Alex Hassel. I am here on behalf of the League of Minnesota Cities. I am here on behalf of city election administrators across the state who are incredibly proud of the work that they do and deeply value their role in ensuring secure and fair elections. And I'd like to comment on two parts of this bill, primarily the expansion of early voting. Our cities share the goal of wanting to reach as many voters as possible, and we believe that Minnesota is particularly good at this. But they also know that this must be balanced by ensuring adequate resources, staff, and time to complete any mandate. Under the proposal in this bill, for state general elections, cities and counties would be required to administer early voting for the 18 days leading up to the election, with only three weekend days off from public-facing work. And I say public-facing work because our city clerks are often putting in many hours over those weekends to catch up on other work. The early voting process does create some efficiencies in comparison to the current direct balloting process, but the expanded days beyond one week uh, will still cause some shifts in work. We are concerned that these additional required weekend days will burn out elections administrators during their most important time of the year by requiring mandated and often unpaid overtime leading into election day. Cities do face challenges in recruiting enough election judges already uh, and have some concerns of being able to staff these additional days. We have also heard from some cities who worry that if this were to become law, they may have to consider whether they can continue to administer early voting uh, to provide more locations for their residents or if they will need to give this responsibility back to their county. For these reasons, our members do urge that any additional non-business hours be optional. We know that some of our cities will gladly take advantage of this in the weekends leading up to election day, but also know that some simply won't have the staff or resources. I would like to just briefly mention as well, uh, as it relates to ranked choice voting in the bill, that the league does support the local option for ranked choice voting, and we're glad to see it in the bill. As we know, many of our cities across the state do have some interest in this. On both of these items, we greatly appreciate Chair Carlson and members of the committee's willingness to meet with us on these issues throughout session uh, and hear city perspectives, and we look forward to continuing to work with you as these move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Matt Hilgart, if you can uh, join us at the table, be sure to sign in. Um, and go ahead and state your name, the organization you're with, and go ahead and proceed with your testimony. Madam Chair, thank you. Members of the committee, my name is Matt Hilgart. I work for the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. I'm also here today to speak on behalf of the Minnesota Association of County Officers. Michael Stahlberger, who you've seen before in front of this committee, was unable to join us. I want to thank the chair and author uh, for their inclusion of several provisions, including $800,000 in ADA compliance grants. I believe that was a Senator Hoffman provision. The state match for HAVA funds, which is in sec uh, section six, which will be extremely helpful for cybersecurity upgrades, as well as the election worker protection provisions that I believe Senator Mitchell authored earlier this session. Uh, regarding early voting provisions, I would echo many of the same considerations uh, my colleague Alex Hassel previously stated. Counties very much appreciated the engagement by the author and chair um, and do believe that there are clear efficiencies and positives for voter experiences by allowing a voter to directly insert their ballot into the tabulator during this early voting period. That said, I do want to be crystal clear that the expansion of the voting time frame to 18 days and the inclusion of weeknight and weekend days uh, will increase staff work and cost during an already stressful time of season. And perhaps that's an important reminder for all of us on why ongoing elections funding is so critical and important for local governments and an issue that we have been bringing to this committee's attention. 
Lastly, I would like to close by saying a few things regarding the ranked choice voting sections in this bill. We do very much appreciate all the changes that have been made recently to address questions brought by administrators and the Secretary of State's office and the inclusion of a local option. Similar to the League of Minnesota Cities, we do have counties that support this local option. We agree that it is critical this task force addresses feasibility and potential logistical challenges, and we're grateful for the inclusion of that language. And we are significantly interested in keeping the two most important constituencies in mind when we go through this task force, and that is voters and the people who are administer our election system. I'll end by saying we very much hope to get back on this task force. Uh, originally, AMC had three members on this task force. I hope it wasn't anything that I said, but now we are down to zero. Um, our members are extremely engaged in this issue, and I, I would just respectfully remind folks that um, it will be elected boards. It will be elected commissioners uh, making the decision on whether or not to implement RCV at a local level. They will be making that policy decision, and they will be making the ensuing budgetary decisions on how to support this at a local level. So we would like to see at minimum one member from the Association of Minnesota Counties and elected county commissioner on this task force. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Carlson, thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Hilgart. Uh, our next testifier is Rod Adams, who I believe is appearing by Zoom. Mr. Adams, state your name for the record and then please proceed with your testimony. Absolutely. My name is Rod Adams. I am the, first off, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Rod Adams. I'm the executive director and founder of the New Justice Project Minnesota. So we're a member-led racial and economic justice organization that organizes black workers around issues in the workplace, but also work deeply in both city and statewide elections. Um, our institution, we center democracy and racial equity at the core of our work, and I'm joining you today to speak on behalf of uh, SF 1636. Uh, this bill and its passage are crucial for our members. It's also a crucial measure for all working class Minnesotans, both conservatives and progressives, to be able to have the time necessary to exercise their right to their right to go to the polls and vote for who represents them. And with that, the policies that will literally impact their everyday lives. We at the New Justice Project know that our members who are mostly low income, work two and sometimes three jobs in multiple industries just to make ends meet. And on top of that, have entire families who they need to prioritize spending time with. So this confluence makes it incredibly difficult for workers to get to the polls on election day and even in other instances of early voting. A lot of our members believe they will either have to take a day off to go to the polls or a couple of hours off of work. So a large, of them, a large number of them just forgo going all together. Because for low-income workers, a day or even a few hours off of work might mean a light bill, a phone bill, or rent may be short. Because especially in the moment of global inflation, our budgets are tight. Additionally, this could put them in a position where catching up on bills could also almost be impossible. Enacting a system of true early voting in our state will have a huge impact on our members and all working class Minnesotans. It would allow there to be more access for people to vote outside of traditional work hours and on weekends and general elections. If voting is the foundation of our democracy, expanding the right to do so is both common sense, but also paramount to having a thriving democratic state. We're also glad to see the provision in the elections omnibus bill, uh, SF 1362, that will give people the right in time off to work for the full 46 days of early voting. Because as stated before, workers in precarious occupations are very hesitant to request time off because of fear of losing income and even in some instances losing their jobs. This is something we can prevent with the passage of SF 1326. Finally, we encourage you to consider adding extended days for primary and other elections as well. General elections are important, but state and local ballots are where we often find referendums that will materially change the lives of black and brown workers before they will feel the effect of any federal policies. Um, and with that, thank you for my time and I hope to see the committee support of a democracy that makes room for all Minnesotans to play a role inside of it. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Thank members. you, Mr. Adams. I appreciate your testimony today. Um, next up, we have Maureen Reed from uh, Fair Vote Minnesota. And Hallie Norman, you are on deck if you want to come and take a seat on the other side of Chair Carlson. And Ms. Reed, if you want to state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Westland. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Maureen Reed. I am retired from the practice of medicine and teach part-time at the University of Minnesota. But I am here today as chair of the board of Fair Vote Minnesota, which is Minnesota's not-for-profit organization uh, whose mission is to advance ranked choice voting uh, throughout Minnesota. Um, 
my role as board chair takes me to a lot of interesting places and interesting conversations. And just if you can picture for a moment uh, the state of Minnesota, I've had the opportunity to go to Tower, to go to Laverne, to go to Slayton, to go to St. Peter, to go to um, Fergus Falls, Alexandria, Bemidji, Mankato, and talk about ranked choice voting. And I can tell you, as I move about the state of Minnesota, I see as much interest in ranked choice voting in the whole of Minnesota as we do here in the metro. I would echo what the earlier testifier, uh, Ms. Uh, Hassel, said uh, from the League of Minnesota Cities, that cities are interested in exploring what this option might be for them. And recently, and, uh, we see that the city of Bemidji passed a resolution in support of this legislation. Uh, and you have other uh, pieces of uh, support in your packets in an earlier committee packets as well. As I've traveled about this state, uh, what I see is that voters are interested in having more choice and more voice in their election system. Under our current election system, we have seen increasing political divisiveness and extremism. This is worrisome to me and to many people throughout Minnesota. If we elect our officials in a different way, where candidates must focus on the issues and must appeal to a majority of voters in order to carry the day, we could reverse those disturbing trends and heal these divisions. Ranked choice voting, sometimes in different places known as instant runoff voting, empowers voters to rank candidates, ensuring that our elected leaders have earned the support of a majority of those voters. And it fosters a more inclusive, more representative, more responsive government. Ranked choice voting is a simple change, but it has very significant, very profound consequences. It transforms the incentives in voting and in our political system and serves as an antidote to political extremism and divisions. Thank you for including ranked choice voting legislation, the Protect and Advance Democracy Act, SF 2270, in this omnibus bill. The amended bill gives more local jurisdictions the opportunity to uh, employ and deploy ranked choice voting if they wish. And we know that several cities have expressed for a long time their desire to do this. Giving communities this local control is a way that suits us all and advances good public policy. By creating the task force, the Protect and Advance Democracy Act gives an opportunity for stakeholders to have productive discussions about how and when to implement ranked choice voting for state and federal elections in Minnesotans. It's the perfect vehicle for this important conversation to occur. I hope it provides not just a way forward for the state of Minnesota, but I hope that it becomes a model for other states as well who are looking for options. On behalf of the Fair Vote Minnesota Board, I urge your support for SF 1636 with ranked choice voting. And I thank you for taking this historic step and allowing Minnesota's future to be even brighter and more promising than its past. Thank you, and thank you, Senator Carlson. Thank you for your testimony. Be sure to sign in on our sheet there. And then uh, Ms. Norman, is it Halley or Haley? You can say your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you so much. Um, it's Halley. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Senator Carlson. Thank you, committee members, for having me today. Uh, my name is Halley Norman, and I am the Democracy Movement Organizer for Minnesota Voice, uh, a coalition of 40 organizations across Minnesota working to close the civic and political participation gaps in communities of color. Today, though, I'm also here to speak to my experience as a former elections administrator. In 2020, I worked as an election judge coordinator in Minneapolis. In this role, I saw firsthand the ways that people who seek to undermine the strength of our democracy actively threaten those upholding it. From election judges, I heard stories of campaigners circling polling precincts and trucks in areas with high populations of BIPOC and young voters. 
I also heard stories of election judges themselves presenting problems. A black voter initially be de being denied the right to vote because a judge mistook them for a previous black voter, or judges disrespecting one another because of their gender identity. As an elections administrator myself, returning late to our office from collecting polling place materials on election night, I was rushed inside because campaigners were camped in trucks outside of our office filming our front doors and attempting to gain access to secured ballot storage. We should all be able to participate in our election systems without fear or harassment or intimidation for doing our civic duty. Instead, I felt unsafe in my office simply for doing my job. In the last three years, and even pre-2020, we have seen drastically increased rates of voter, voter and election judge intimidation, and this bill takes a step towards combating that. Through this experience, I also saw the importance of simplifying the early voting process for election judges and for voters. Our current system of in-person absentee voting is confusing and laborious for, both party, for all parties. <laughs> voters question why they have to fill out a new application when they're already registered, or why they can't simply feed their ballot into the tabulator as they would on election day. Election judges are required to navigate explaining this process while also managing significant amounts of extra paperwork. A true early voting system would simplify this process for all involved. Today, I am also here on behalf of Minnesota Voice because we know that these issues disproportionately impact the communities we serve. In, story, in the stories of intimidation I shared, BIPOC voters and poll workers were often the targets, and in our current absentee system, they are more likely to be shut out of, by unnecessarily complex paperwork. To close existing gaps, we have to ensure that participation does not feel unsafe or overly burdensome. Preventing intimidation and harassment of voters and election judges while also making it easier to cast your ballot strengthens democracy for us all. I encourage you to support the omnibus bill before you today and help make voter, voting a safer and simpler process for everyone involved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be sure to sign in on our sheet there. Um, our next testifier is Michael Sack, and he is on by Zoom. Um, Mr. Sack, if you could state your name for the record and then go ahead and proceed with your testimony. My name is Michael Sack, a disability advocate from Minneapolis. It is extremely important and essential to have every polling location accessible to voters with physical and developmental disabilities, as well as to blind and hard of hearing individuals. In order to have a fair election, all eligible Minnesotans must be provided features and services to create an easy voting experience. That means all polling locations absolutely should have an accessible entrance. Election officials who are trained assisting voters with impairments, multiple ballot marking machines, and officials who are able to repair the adapted voting devices on site. Although I fully support the two provisions that would enhance the accessibility of polling facilities, I want to take the time to suggest two things that I believe would make SF-1636 stronger and more appropriate. First off, Regarding section 1.29, I want to recommend making it crystal clear that a voter who wants assistance is perfectly allowed to ask an election official for help. As I mentioned earlier, I would like to also propose adding that an election official who knows how to fix a machine is obligated to be stationed at each polling place in case one malfunctions. Since I have limited dexterity, I use the Omniballot machine to vote. During the last election, the ballot marking device would not work when I attempted to select my choices. Neither election judge knew how to fix it, so they had to help me fill out a paper ballot. That was successful, but it would have been nice if someone was there who knew how to fix the mechanism. Adding a trained official at each location would be a big benefit for the disability community as it would ease concerns of unsolvable problems from occurring. 
If we want to live in a true democracy, we must allow every resident who is eligible to vote and participate in decision making no matter their ability. That is especially true for residents with disabilities and the programs that assist them, who at times feel like they are not being heard. They definitely have things to say and contribute, however we must provide them the necessary tools to do so. Everyone should feel comfortable to make their voices heard and that all starts with voting. It is time to invest in us. Thank you for letting me speak today about this important matter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sack. We appreciate you being with us here today. Thank you for your testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, we have Hennepin County Commissioner Kevin Anderson, and on deck we have David Fisher. So if you each want to come and take a seat at the table, um, Commissioner Anderson, if you will state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Kevin Anderson, uh, Hennepin County Commissioner representing District 7. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Hennepin County takes very seriously the obligation of administering elections with integrity, ensuring that every eligible person has the most seamless, accessible, and enjoyable experience of voting. In our most recent general election, uh, we saw voter participation at almost 600,000 voters, the most of any local jurisdiction, uh, with a 70% turnout rate. So we're excited about how this omnibus bill deepens the partnerships we have, ensuring our residents can exercise their rights to vote. I want to highlight just a few areas that we are particularly glad to see in this, uh, in this bill. First and foremost, I want to thank you for ensuring that the state provides sufficient funds to meet the federal matching requirements for the Help America's Vote Act. This legislation provides a base funding that the Secretary of State and our counties braid together to ensure our election departments have the resources necessary so people can vote. In 2022, Hennepin County budgeted over $9.6 million to conducting elections. So to county officials making budget decisions for elections, trust me, every state and federal dollar counts. Second, the protections and safety of our election administrators, staff, and election judges is a top concern. Protecting the safety and integrity of our election equipment and voter information is paramount to maintaining this most basic of constitutional rights to vote. Hennepin County election staffs, like those in so many other jurisdictions in Minnesota and across the country, have been subjected to harassment and intimidation while trying to do their jobs. And while we added extra security at our elections office to help protect our workers and equipment, we feel that this legislation would provide an additional level of deterrence for those who choose to violate the law. On behalf of the hundreds of staff and volunteers in our election department, thank you. I also want to say thank you for including more consistent standards for early voting. Uh, we want voters to vote when they want and to know that their vote will be counted in time to be reported on election night. We've lacked this consistent standard for this process and we want to thank the Secretary of State Simon for, for leading the charge and improving efficiency in early voting. These provisions will enable us to make voting more accessible to everyone. Thank you also for funding Senator Hoffman's bill to expand accessibility at polling locations. The funding in your omnibus bill will ensure that everyone can have an accessible path to casting a vote regardless of their level of need. And finally, I want to take just a moment to express my support for the provisions to responsibly explore ranked choice voting in Minnesota. I applaud any effort intended to create an election system that honors every voice and encourages positive campaigning. So in closing, I want to say that we support this bill. We thank you for investing in the systems and the people that make us home to the highest voter turnout in the nation. Madam Chair uh, and members, thank you again for the opportunity to testify on this legislation and uh, thank you for, for bringing this for us.
Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Anderson. And Mr. Fisher, you're up next. If you could please uh, state your name for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Yes, uh, Chair Westland and Senator Carlson and members. My name is David Fisher. I'm here in support of SF 1636 as amended, representing here today Clean Elections Minnesota. Who have we been here enough? I don't need to really introduce them. I am uh, teach at the University of Minnesota and I'm a former uh, commission, Minnesota Commissioner of Administration. This month was the anniversary of Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama, where black Americans were assaulted marching for their right to vote. To commemorate, President Biden acknowledged that, quoting him, the right to vote, the right to vote and to have your vote counted is a threshold of democracy and liberty. With it, anything is possible. Without it, without that right, nothing is possible. Minnesota is known for its fair and safe elections, as you've heard from others here today. And SF 1636 continues the tradition, maintaining what Lyndon Johnson called the most powerful instrument ever devised for breaking down injustice by upholding both the right of citizens to self-governance and the opportunity to, to exercise it. We support SF 1636 for these reasons, and in particular, the following. The Ranked Choice Voting Task Force and RCV grants and accessibility grants in Article 1. Penalties and enforcement for intimidating or interfering with election official, officials in Article 2, Sections 1 and 60. And I sit before you today as an election official myself. Providing procedures for early voting in Article 2, Sections 14 through 25. Alerting election officials of prisoner release so they may be informed of their right to vote in Article 2, Sections 12 through 13. Authorizing local adoption of ranked choice voting in Article 2, Sections 44 through 59. And establishing a task force to recommend how ranked voice voting would work statewide in Article 2, Section 65 and were heartened that ethnic Indian affairs and disability councils were included in this task force. Committee members, thank you. We urge your support for SF 1636. Thank you so much. Be sure to sign in on the sheet. Uh, Paul Huffman is next, and then we have Lily Sassy uh, from We Choose Us will be our final testifier. Feel free to come up and You'll be on deck. Uh, Mr. Huffman, if you could state your name for the record and then go ahead and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Westlin, and uh, thank you, committee members, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Paul Huffman. I'm uh, testifying today based on my experience as a head election judge in four different precincts and as a member of the ballot board in Washington County over the last three years. I am also a member of the board of directors of the League of Women Voters of Minnesota and co lead of voter service. Um, I'm speaking today to support uh, Senate File 1636 and in, per in particular the importance of protecting election officials from threats and intimidation and showing our support for them. Uh, the concern addressed in this bill, as you've heard from uh, prior uh, testimony and also testified elsewhere by the Secretary of State, is not uh, imaginary or hypothetical. Um, the issue is real and it has caused some election professionals to leave their roles um, due to the ongoing pressure and challenge and stress. In parts of our country outside of Minnesota, there have been specific uh, situations where election officials and poll workers have received threats on their lives or on the lives of their families. In some cases, poll workers have had to go into hiding for fear of their or their family's safety. While the threats uh, and intimidation to election officials is not of the same degree in Minnesota as elsewhere, uh, we have seen the, same, seen the same underlying beliefs and behaviors by those who have been led to believe without evidence that has withstood judicial scrutiny that our elections uh, are not secure and outcomes cannot be trusted. This has included uh, well-organized, well-funded groups in Minnesota with paid speakers and consultants from outside of our state that have been at county board meetings arguing that our current elections and election officials cannot be trusted and that those election processes must be changed. I personally know election judges are either reluctant to work at the polls or who have stopped working at the polls due to concern for harassment based on the current environment and events that have taken place outside of Minnesota. 
As a head election judge, I personally had to ask vote, had voters ask me to see internet connection to the voting equipment, um, whether they can take pictures of the voting equipment, and if asked to take a picture of their ballot and track it to make sure their vote is casted accurately. Um, these questions cause you know, concern and discomfort for election judges. And for frequently, as the head judge, I have to intervene in order to defuse these situations and work through that uh, concern. We can't legislate what people may believe, but we can legislate how people may behave. Um, while there are laws regarding uh, potential threats and harassment of uh, public officials, uh, these are pretty general and lack the specificity warranted based on the specific role of election officials who have a specific role in each of you being in the position you hold today. Uh, this bill would make it clear to those who might harass or threaten election officials, as well as to those same election officials and workers, that those threats and harassment are not acceptable and will not be tolerated. No matter what a person may choose to believe about the integrity and fairness of the elections, election officials, and our election systems. So thank you, and I ask you to support uh, Senate File 1630, 1636. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony, Mr. Huffman. And Ms. Sassy, you are our last person. Please state your name for the record and then go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lily Sassy, and I am the director of We Choose Us. We are a coalition of over 35 partner organizations working to build an inclusive multiracial democracy in Minnesota. I have had the pleasure of testifying before you all several times this session and want to thank you all for the pro-voter legislation you've considered to protect and expand access to our democracy. We built our expanding democracy legislative agenda last fall by talking to voters across the state, asking them on the doors and at our democracy summits about the improvements they wanted to see made. We talked to organizers and partners of our coalition who interact regularly with voters in BIPOC and immigrant communities, young working class and rural voters, and other communities who have been historically disenfranchised. And we know that this is the first step in doing all that we need to do to make the promise of democracy real for us all. We're thrilled to see that so many of these things ended up in the Senate elections omnibus bills, concretely in the bill before you today. Uh, we're excited about budget allocations to support grants for polling locations and make them more physically accessible, establishing a system of true early voting to make the process less onerous on elections administrators and extended voting uh, days and hours for voters, protections for election workers from intimidation and harassment, and unrestricting HAVA funding to ensure our elections are properly resourced. We would have uh, really loved to see a similar budget allocation to grants to those doing voter education for new and returning citizens. As we know, information, accurate and factual information is a critical piece of maintaining a healthy democracy. Um, we also would recommend considering extending hours for early voting in primaries and other elections rather than just the general election. Uh, it's important that we signal to voters that we value their voice and participation at all stages of an election cycle, not just at the end. Uh, and we would also like to propose, just if you, as you've considered the provision to facilitate voting for residents of assisted living facilities, to extend the same rights to those voting in jail who have not been convicted of a felony on election day or during the absentee voting period. The conversations and debate uh, in this committee this session have been promising as we look towards the future of our democracy. I want to thank you all for your leadership, and we uh, really look forward to continue working with you uh, to continue Minnesota's long tradition of free and fair elections and robust civic engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sassy. Um, so just to let members know sort of where, where we're going next, we'll have an opportunity for um, members of the committee to ask questions of the chief author, any of the testifiers who uh, are still with us here in the committee. Um, we will be considering amendments on Thursday um, so once we uh, have a little discussion here, we will um, lay the bill over thurs uh, until Thursday. So any members have any questions for our testifiers? Madam Chair. Senator Curran. So again, I think the biggest changes is um, in this particular bill, the embedded uh, ranked choice voting. And so I... It's amazing, that, again, the continued theme about increasing access. And so those of you that weren't here before, I'm not sure why everybody would support the fair, fair vote organization that uh, works to limit access. And so where this has been in, put in place, it's actually worked. The, in fact, I think the founding member or the, the leader, Ms. Massey, 
supported initiatives because too many people participated and there were no barriers to participate to become a candidate in any election in Minnesota today. And so this is a solution looking for a problem that doesn't exist. And when you look at it, the, the city of Minneapolis had a, had a filing fee of $20 prior to their first election. Immediately, because it wasn't convenient, um, because it created a lot of chaos and a lot of confusion, which again builds on the lack of trust for the entire election system. That's something fair, understandable, and only people that are eligible to vote, or vote can vote, and we all agree on that. But in this particular case, look what it's done to limit access. So now to file to run for the city of Minneapolis and now the city of St. Paul, you must come up with a $500 filing fee. It's $100 higher than to, for the position of filing to become the governor of Minnesota, the highest office in the state. And so all of the, the stated benefits kind of fall on deaf ears because every single person I heard talk today, again, was about how the, how the, the save democracy, all the, all the changes that we're doing. Um, yet, finish off, we have the highest voter participation in the entire nation. We don't have a disenfranchisement. People participate at all levels and barriers and, and things have been knocked down. And so at that time then, I have to question why are we considering 30 bills that changes every aspect of it? Um, there are a few things in here, but when you look at um, pop-up polling places, in addition to the terrible idea of ranked choice voting, pop-up polling places are unnecessary completely. If an election uh, official has determined that there's a, a need and that because of the migration or the change in the particular population in a two-year period, they have more than ample time to be able to, to declare new voting polls or new voting locations, voting locations. And you have ample time to notify everybody, and I don't see anything here that provides ample time to notify anybody for, for the pop-up locations because I think the, the date is 14 weeks prior to election day which we don't have election day anymore, we have election season. That just happens to be the end of the election season. And if you're gonna have notification, notification should be well in advance, six months or more in advance to follow statute on declaring voter locations. We need to be able to make sure that everybody has access to, to be able to go out and view and verify and make sure election judges can be assigned to those random locations. It's a disservice to the people that it's claimed to serve and I worry about it's a, it's a service that will serve very limited populations. I think the last hearing we had, somebody talked about in a college campus. Well, if it was deemed that it was a co college campus was a need, then we should have declared that as a polling place up early on. But worries me more is even the description of that, that testifier that said, um, it's great we have kind of a, a party election party day. Polling place is a polling place, and so, we're not there to party. It's not there to influence and not there to have, I think, one of the rock the vote type scenarios. We need to make sure that there are official polling places that make sure both and all, all parties have access um, timely to be able to assign election judges to make sure the proper oversight so everybody trusts, their, trusts the vote. Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, the whole bill is filled with a whole bunch of uh, solutions looking for problems that don't exist. And, and I would argue, I would, I would say, the only, the last thing I'll end with is the, uh, the goal to eliminate, you know, the extremism. I think we do see that. Um, it has, it has really accelerated. I see it mostly in two cities, St. Paul, and Minneapolis, who have had ranked choice voting probably the longest. I think the threats against those city officials or the city council people in the city of Minneapolis are terrible. And no one should tolerate that. We put in new. We're going to make those types of harassments doubly, uh, doubly illegal by, by imposing new penalties when those things are already illegal. But those people are being harassed by the very people who, who are in that city who are not um, happy with the results of either the election and or the people who, who were elected and their ability to deliver on the policies they promise. And so we have seen it. But in this case, it's really not an oppositional party. It's all everybody with the same belief system. It should stop. And they've been the most aggressive and the most violent, at least the most threatening. Um, and thank God it hasn't led to violence yet. Um, and so it hasn't done, this vo voting system certainly hasn't done that. It hasn't, it hasn't stopped any, quote, extremism. And we have the greatest, as 
the words I hear every day, we have one of the most trustworthy election processes, and I see no need to have 30 bills to change every single facet of the election system when we're trying to build trust on both sides of the party, so, or all for every voter. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's a, a, a series of bad ideas looking for a solution. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coran. Um, just got a couple of, couple of notes here. The, the, um, the pop-ups have to provide 14-week notice. So, so that is a pretty significant notice in advance of where those locations will be. I guess the other thing that I would note um, is that in 2022, we had a 61% turnout rate, which for a midterm um, might not be horrible, but, but the highest uh, midterm was 64.3% in 2018, and the 20-year average is about 59.5% midterm races. Uh, that's starting to look like a non-participatory democracy in many ways, and what we need to be doing is encouraging people to vote, give them options to vote, uh, including uh, early voting. So I'm, I, I guess I would respectfully disagree that these are solutions in search of a problem. We do know that in the last election also, 672,000 ballots uh, were cast by absentee or mail-in voting, which was around 27% of the vote. Uh, so we do know that if we increase the ability for people to actually go in early, put their ballot into a machine, uh, it's likely to increase uh, voting. And so, um, again, we have some philosophical differences here, but I, I did want to at least um, correct some of that information and just say, as in order for us to function best, um, in order to ensure that people elect their leaders rather than leaders choosing their voters. We need to make sure that we have a system that works, that is accessible, um, and that provides the greatest options possible for every eligible voter to be able to uh, exercise that franchise. Uh, so that's my little, little statement. Uh, any other comments or questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we have a fiscal note here. I'm just wondering if we've uh, gotten a report back on the request for a local impact statement. Um, I understand that that actually was not requested, according to our staff. I would like a local impact statement requested from finance on this bill. Please. So, Mr. Erickson, can you talk about that, how that would uh, work? Madam Chair, a local impact note can be requested by the chair or the ranking member of the Finance Committee. So, I, Senator Anderson, I, you might um, speak with Senator Marty or Senator Pratt about um, having one requested for the bill. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right, this bill will be laid over until Thursday, at which time uh, we will be considering any amendments that folks need to bring. Um, so with that, we are adjourned.